of the world's largest prayer and praise gathering. Join us on Praise the Lord from the Great Northwest as we bring you anointed pastors, evangelists, teachers, authors, and other special guests with testimonies and teaching to encourage and inspire and music to glorify God as we lift up Jesus Christ as Lord. Hi, welcome uh, to this program. I'm so excited. Uh, my name is Pastor Mark Biltz with El Shaddai Ministries. I have with me today uh, Pastor Art, uh, my associate pastor at El Shaddai Ministries. And we have one of the most exciting guests you have yes. ever seen before Absolutely. with us today. But right now I'd like to introduce our guest, Randy Neal yes. with Christians United yes. for Israel. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Thank, thank you. you. Of course. Thank you for having me today. That's great. We're really excited for you to be here. And I tell you what, you guys, it won't be but a few moments, and you're going to hear some of the most incredible things you've ever heard. Yeah. But first, we want to introduce Sarah Sanders, uh, one of the musicians with El Shaddai Ministries. And this is a song that she wrote, Shalu Shalom. <laughs> Thank you. That was just wonderful, Sarah. Uh, the way I'd like to start this out this morning is, as you know, the Holocaust ended about 70 years ago or so. So uh, after the Holocaust, Israel became a nation. And uh, ever since then, anti-Semitism has gone away, right? Hardly. <laughs> <laughs> well, could you give us, Randy, a little bit of a reality check on whether anti-Semitism anti has been coming back or... Give us a reality check here. Well, you know, before we talk about it coming back, I think we need to, to take a look at where it came from and a little, a little history about it. And, right. we, and we need to appreciate the fact that uh, 
that uh, the theology, uh, the doctrine of, of replacement theology, supersession theology, which means that God is a, you know, he changed his mind. He said everlasting with <laughs> yeah. the covenants to the Jewish people. He changed his mind, broke off those covenants. And when man thinks if God, you know, is going to cast off these people, who am I as a mortal man to be above, you know, God's decision? And so that really was the birth canal for replacement theology. And replacement theology was really the birth canal for anti-Semitism. Which was birthed a long time ago. Which was birthed a long while ago. We, you know, we, if you take a look at the, at the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, uh, we see this pattern, this thread of his incredible plan and purpose and love for his firstborn, the apple of his eye, uh, that he would make a spectacle out of them if necessary to reveal and glorify himself. But uh, the Christian church did not really heed that. You know, Paul warns us in Romans 11, don't get all haughty. Don't get all arrogant. You're just a wild olive branch that's, that's right. been grafted in. You're not the root system. And uh, if he can break off the original branch, he can break off the grafted branch. But that's a, a warning that the early church did not heed. And you see it, you know, I do pastor's lunches and meetings across this, across this nation. I have done literally hundreds of meetings with pastors to thousands of pastors. And when I, uh, when I you know, I, I take a poll, how many of you, when you were in the Theological Institute, the seminary where you got your sheepskin that claims mm -hmm. that you have a master's <laughs> or a bachelor's or a doctorate, how many of you were required as the curriculum to read or write a single paragraph about the Crusades, about the Inquisitions, about the pogroms, about the Holocaust? All of these things happened by the hands under the watchful eyes of people claiming to be Christians, under the banner of Christendom, and invariably uh, virtually none have. Only two to this day raised their hand and said that I was. One of them studied in Jerusalem, so he didn't count. But, uh, <laughs> but the reality is, is that all these things did happen. And, uh, you know, we, we have to really take a look. Most Christians, and we spoke about this last night at dinner, most Christians are oblivious to what happened before them, so they don't feel accountable for what happened at the hands of our predecessors. But they don't realize that in 1099, Crusaders march into Jerusalem. One of the first things that they do is they herd all of the Jews into the synagogue. They wrap right. chains around the doors. They light it on fire. And they march around it singing, Christ, we adore thee. Incredible. And most people yeah. have, they're oblivious. That. And, and there's people right now that are watching this program and they wish that they could reach through the screen and say, Randy, hold on just a second. You know and I know that those people didn't have the heart or mind of Christ. They couldn't have done that. That's right. And, and I say, you're absolutely right. But go tell that to the Jewish people. Right, exactly. Because as far as they're concerned, you know, we're part of, of that inclusive package. Yeah. And so it's, that, that's really the history. Now, now Europe, Russia, uh, the Arab nations, they really were, uh, the, you know, the foundation of anti-Semitism for centuries. America did have some chapters. But up until recently, it, it was not as vitriolic uh, as we're seeing it is today. You know what's interesting? I'm talking just talking about America in general. So a lot of us are, are of course, are baby boomers, mm -hmm. and uh, some of us are second generation. And our parents or grandparents came over from Europe, so they had more of an exposure to some of the history that you're talking about because they came from so-called the motherland. Mm -hmm. But that history, that knowledge of the Jewish people and the things that the Jewish people went through, are covered over sometimes in this generation because history is being almost rewritten in our college campuses today and in our schools. That's why it's important to always bring this knowledge back to people so that they understand where the Jewish people came from and where Christianity came from, quite frankly, as well. That's correct. Yes, you know, a lot of us, you know, we, we want to believe in our heart of hearts that we would be among the righteous, that we would lay our life on the line, you know, for, for those of, should the, something like the Holocaust try to repeat itself. And I would suggest to you that we, are at that fork in the road. We are at the threshold where there are individuals and events taking their mark on the international stage that looks like history wants to repeat just itself. Just a few. History just does few. repeat itself. Yes. Well, I had just uh, heard recently that they're doing a march on Jerusalem, but this is an anti-Semitism uh, type of a march that they're doing. As a matter of fact, in uh, Bethlehem, uh, recently they had this event called Christ at the Checkpoint, and the whole philosophy of it was how if Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem, he couldn't even make it to Jerusalem because he'd have all these Israeli checkpoints he'd have to go through. <laughs> and uh, I had heard the, uh, some of the comments that people had made there. The, the head speaker was saying how Jesus' main enemy was the Jewish people. 
Uh, do you think that would have been his greatest enemy? <laughs> no, no, that was his that was his first and greatest audience. Yes, and so that's right. uh, you know a lot of a lot of people don't even realize Jesus is Jewishness. And, what? And, and a lot, you know, uh, you know, Paul warns us about Judaizing, and some people have taken that to such an extreme, rigid law mm -hmm. that they right. that they have uh, really cheated and shortchanged themselves of appreciating the Jewish roots of our faith and the Jewishness of Jesus. And 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 when they really get a grasp, and that's what I love about El Shaddai Ministries. Yeah, the Seattle area, the Tacoma area, is so blessed to have your ministry uh, that, that it, it, you are able to give people those lenses. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That you, you're able to give the people those lenses where they can reread the Hebrew scriptures and the Greek scriptures and passages that they've known all their life come that have a whole entirely new meaning. And it doesn't take them anywhere. It takes them deeper into their Christian faith with a deeper and richer understanding. Yeah, one thing that's so important to me that when I speak on replacement theology myself uh, is history is written by the victor. Okay. Now, do you think our media is biased, Randy, at all? Oh, my <laughs> word. Yes, our, I, I didn't used to think that our media was biased. But, uh, and I shared this last night, and I'll share it again right now. You know, I, I thought that that was a conspiracy theory. I, I, I was a lover of Israel, <laughs> I was a denouncer of replacement theology. But I wasn't necessarily a, a, a champion of, as far as political advocacy or political activism goes for the nation of Israel and U.S. Israel relations until one day I was reading the paper and I saw this article. And I believe it was in 2004. Uh, I, I could be mistaken, but I believe it was in 2004 where militants had stormed a Jewish holy site. And uh, it was, it was a, a sacred tomb in, uh, in Jewish history. And uh, they stormed this Jewish holy site. It, under, under the Oslo Accords, all Jewish holy sites were supposed to be protected, but somebody didn't pay attention to that, and they allowed <laughs> this to occur. Uh, a couple days later, I'm reading the same paper, little article inside a few pages on the inside column. Uh, you know, militants declare Jewish holy site a Muslim mosque. And okay, that's kind of odd that you know, somebody's not enforcing the Oslo Accord agreement. A few days later, I'm reading the same, I'm following the same thread on this narrative. And the, the, the third article, the Israeli Defense Force tried to reclaim this holy site. And what's the tagline on the article? Israel attacks Muslim holy site. Yes, that's and right. And so, uh, you know, at that point, that's when I realized, okay, we are, we are living in an hour where, where dark is being called light and evil is being called yeah. good. And what's so interesting, too, is that because of the media, we all grew up with TV. Uh, and with the introduction of uh, videos and DVDs in the media today, many people, especially young people, believe everything that they see on TV and in the news uh, and as well as on the Internet because the Internet now is probably the highest source of media. Everybody's carrying around their phones and so on, and they believe what the news tells them. An American can put its own spin on the news. Well, it was interesting. We were just in Israel uh, recently, and we were with a family, and we were talking about just, you know, how, how should Israel be promoted? And one of the things that this individual in the family said was that uh, Israel is not the place where Jews and the Hamas and Hezbollah fight. It's where Jesus walked. And you can feel the Lord's, Israel is, is one big archaeological dig, and the Lord's presence is all over there. And that's really yeah. what we need to focus on, is what the Lord has done in Israel and what God is doing there today. Sure. The, uh, one of the interesting things is, as far as the media being biased, can you believe our translators of our Bible might have been biased? <laughs> that's right. <clears throat> that's what's amazing to me. Because uh, most people know that uh, the Greek word uh, for church would be ekklesia. Uh, but what's amazing is why they translate ecclesia as church in some verses, they use assembly in another verse. Yeah, For example, in Acts, where they're all worshiping the great goddess Diana, it says, and then they dismiss the ecclesia. Oh, we can't make them think the church is worshiping Diana, so we're gonna write assembly there. Well, it's the same thing with synagogue. Uh, the Greek word uh, for a congregation or an assembly as well, but that became synagogue in English. Well, in the book of James, it talks about if one comes into your synagogue, your synagogue with a rich apparel on, well, they said, oh, we can't make everyone think they're coming in the synagogue, so we're going to translate that as assembly. And then in the book of Revelation, where it talks about the synagogue of Satan, well, that's synagogue. How come they didn't translate it as assembly there? So anyone can go and check their concordance and see the, the bias that even the translator right. has. Mm -hmm. right. 
It's incredible. Right. You know, I'm glad I'm going to use that word bias as a segue for a shameless plug. Okay, okay. sure. Or, uh, you know, uh, uh, on uh, March 26th, we're going to have a Standing with Israel yes. event. Uh, at, at El Shaddai Ministries, and uh, we invite our listening audience to uh, we're to attend that. To that. <clears throat> and and I would be I'd be remiss if I did not say that it's going to be an extremely biased presentation. Uh, <laughs> that uh, it, you know, we hope that those that attend will leave with the incre incredibly radical notion that Israel has the right to exist. And uh, if. if <clears throat> As, as long as you're giving a shameless plug, why don't you be the first to let everyone know in the Seattle area about someone else who's coming in yes, August? Yes, that would be a good on idea. On August 27th, uh, again, at the Church for All Nations, uh, El Shaddai Ministries, we are going to have the privilege to have a Night to Honor Israel, a, a Christian United for Israel Night to Honor Israel, and our keynote speaker is going to be our founder and national chair, Pastor John yes, Hagee. Wonderful. Great. Very good. So... For uh, information on the location and time and how to RSVP for both of those events, simply visit cufi.org online and go to our event calendar and you can get more information. Yeah, well, that's a, it's going to be an awesome meeting. There are a lot of things and there's a lot of things. You talked about your pastor's luncheons that you do, uh, which, you know, I've been to many of those. And, uh, and, and it's amazing that even a lot of our pastors aren't aware of a lot of things that happen in just the 20th century. So we know we had World War I, we had World War II. And uh, when we talk about uh, the persecution on the Jewish people, of course, Hitler uh, was the centerfold of World War II. Now, we had discussed this earlier, uh, and of course, he, is, uh, he has a regular program on TBN, which is uh, Ray Comfort, which is the way of the master. And he put out recently, not too long ago, uh, a short uh, video about, it's called 180, I believe, where he goes on a college campus. Now, you just viewed that recently, and I know you deal with a lot of college students to show how close this is uh, with our youth and their understanding of what happened in the 20th century. Do you want to comment on what your perceptions were of that video when you saw that? The, well, that video just further confirmed what we're seeing all across the country. And it's not just on our campuses. It's not just with our youth. Uh, and, and the next segment, we're going to really delve deep into uh, Christian Giant for Israel on campus and really just the unthinkable uh, acts uh, the hate speech that's being allowed on our college campuses, as long as it's under the auspices of academic freedom and political dialogue, hate speech laws virtually don't exist. But uh, to, to respond to that, Pastor Artie, exactly to, to give you an example, and, it, and this is more in line with uh, just pastors, uh, that, that video, the 180 that you talked about, it really, it really illustrates not just what happened in the 30s, but what's happening today yes. in America. Uh, the, 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 the only way that a Holocaust is possible, the only way that society can allow genocide under, under their watchful eye is first you have to dehumanize, you have to ultimately dehumanize right. that people group. And before you can dehumanize that people group, you have to demonize that people group. And before you can demonize that people group, you have to delegitimize that people group. And that's exactly what's happening through very subtle, seemingly political correct ways. If I could ask Jennifer in the uh, tech booth uh, to queue up the billboard uh, of the Stop 30 Billion, I'm going to just uh, let people see the graphic. We had a pastor and, and uh, his wife, uh, new leaders for Christian United for Israel, go to our Washington, D.C. summit last July. They came back on fire, but they came back with a heightened awareness of, of how to act for Israel. And when that happens, you have a, a keener sight of the anti-Israel movement. They're driving from Albuquerque to Roswell, and they come across this visual, this billboard, this anti-Israel billboard that's trying to delegitimize and demonize Israel. So this is an actual billboard. This, this is, is an New actual Mexico. billboard, yes. And, wow. And so they, they were convicted. Had they not gone to the D.C. summit, they, they probably had driven by that billboard before without even <laughs> noticing it. But now they had a new critical thinking filter installed, and they caught it. It wasn't, I think, two days later that they called me on the phone. They said, you know what, we'd like to do a a pro-Israel billboard yeah. if we could. And so they well, mustered good. the funds and they, they did the contract and if Jennifer could show that, that flag billboard, then that is the billboard that went up. Those are going up all the time. Right. Right. Those, 
Those billboards have gone up all across New Mexico. They're going up in Washington, California. People are picking them up all over the place. The, the fascinating part is that when they brought this to the attention of the billboard company, the billboard company looked at the message of one, they looked at the message of the other, and they canceled the contract of the first one. Well, what, what's amazing to me is how they can have a billboard up saying stop killing the children when that's what Hamas and Hezbollah does. They purposely terrorize yes. to make sure the schools are being let out when they send over the grad missiles. But you don't hear any grassroots response how horrible that is. Right. And yet when Israel just tries to defend themselves, my goodness, they, there's, there's no media coverage on that. Or they act like they're the ones that are the, the cruel people. Well, that, that's right. I do have to bring this up because I think it is funny that, well, that, well, it's funny or not, but uh, it was just a news item that was in the news uh, yesterday that uh, the reason that they were shooting rockets from the Gaza Strip into Israel was because Israel was trying to test their firepower, so Israel was instigating the rockets. Now, that's a, that's a perfect example of negative media towards Israel, and that, but that's what's reported. It's not that Israel was trying to defend themselves, it's that uh, they were instigating this action. In the last in the last week or so, over 250 rockets have right. been shot from Gaza right. into Israel. Uh, you know, right now, with our budget constraints uh, in this economy, there are elected officials that are seriously considering cutting foreign aid to Israel. We're four years into a 10-year commitment uh, of foreign aid to Israel. Virtually every penny of that foreign aid that we give them, they turn around and spend it here in the United States to yes. buy our military hardware so that they can defend themselves. When they fire off that Iron Dome, they're shooting about 150,000 missile to intercept a $200 rocket. Right. Uh, they're not going to do that just haphazardly. And I, I, as effective as that is, it's not going to be a shield in, around their entire perimeter. And uh, they really do need the United States to, uh, to, to guard their back. Getting, getting back to what you were talking about earlier about the, the, uh, just the, the irony, the hypocrisy. Uh, you know, here we have in 2007, the UN passed five resolutions against 191 nations uh, as far as human rights you know, infractions. Uh, 20 resolutions against the little nation of Israel. Yes. The same, this same organization, the same body, just barely 10 days ago, uh, or when this is aired, maybe, maybe closer to three weeks ago, uh, the UN voted 35 to 8 to allow Syria to remain on the Human Rights Council. Oh, right. <laughs> Horrible. And the thing about it is that, uh, is that the media really doesn't focus on how many people are being killed in Syria. But they'll bring up what the, the handful of rockets that they need to use to defend themselves against Gaza. So that's interesting. <clears throat> in the, a movie most recently in the past two or three years, whenever Mel Gibson came out uh, with The Passion, he even had more sense on how he identified Jesus as Yeshua as the, as the Jewish Jesus. And uh, just going back to that video for a minute with Ray Comfort uh, on the college campuses, because, and I wanted to bring that up for our listening or our audience that uh, is not familiar with that, is that he, what he did was is he showed a picture of Adolf Hitler and asked them if they knew who he was or if they could identify him. And most of the, most of the students did, could not identify him, nor could they identify with what the Holocaust was. And that's what really, non-education and ignorance is really what brings about anti-Semitism, where we are today, uh, because history does repeat itself. Yeah, so. it, it does. And the thing is this, we don't always see what needs to be seen. With the art of computers to manipulate photographs, uh, you can see in the media uh, horrible things that they're doing uh, in their bias. For example, uh, lately they've shown this picture of an Israeli soldier with his foot on some kid's neck. And then uh, it was sent over to Israel, and it wasn't even their uniforms. It just looked like an Israeli uniform. So a lot of these things are being staged. Uh, they're not even true. Uh, and so it's like, wow, you don't, can't always believe what you see even on television because the, the pictures could all be manipulated as well. Well, that was a luxury to even have a uniform because Israel's usually fighting people that are wearing civilian clothing, right. which is uh, is almost like a ghost army. It's and it, and the the lengths, the tireless efforts that they make to minimize uh, civilian casualties is absolutely crazy. Uh, you know, I believe it was Commander Kemp of the British High Command that said that the uh, 
it's, it's, very, it's very common in, a, in any type of military incursion to, to take out one top target, a terrorist target, uh, you're probably going to realize about 19 civilian casualties to get that one target, where Israel uh, has a ratio of about five to that, that one. And nobody gives them credit for the, the lengths and the self-sacrifice, the, the danger that they put themselves in. I want to go back to uh, what Pastor Art was talking about on, on campuses and, and what you, Pastor Mark, were talking about in the anti-Semitism that's reoccurring. It's, it is really a frog in the pot type of mentality. And Pastor Art, it's not just that they don't that they don't know about the history, that they don't know who Adolf Hitler is. Right. It's it's not just what they don't know. It's the propaganda that they're being taught. That's you, right. you may you may ask them who is Adolf Hitler, and they don't know. But ask them what boycott is, and they know. Ask them is Israel an apartheid state, and they think they know, which it is absolutely not. If you have well, any clue right. what the definition of apartheid is. That's right. But uh, you know, if we just unpack boycott, for instance. This area, the greater Northwest, yeah. uh, this, this really is a bastion for the message of boycotting Israeli products. And I will really give, I will challenge our listening, our viewing audience to, to take a serious look at the ramifications. That is not a politically correct, you know, not ominous uh, platform or vehicle. Uh, if you want to couple that with history, uh, w one of the three flags that scholars look back and, and see with the Holocaust is, you know, the first one was the book burning. Right. Brown right. shirts went into the libraries, and if it was written by a Jew or if it sang the praises of the Jews, rip it off the shelves, put it in the streets, and right. light it on fire. The third one was Kristallnacht, where right. basically right. the Broken police, they, they watched on as civilians uh, basically raped and pillaged, burned synagogues, Jewish stores, and homes. Uh, people were murdered and slayed. By the way, for those that you don't know, uh, the damages of Kristallnacht, uh, the Jews were actually blamed for those riots and forced to give their possessions and finances to pay for the damages of Kristallnacht themselves. So wrap how, wrap yeah. your mind around that. Right. So that was the first and the third. The second one was boycotting Jewish businesses. And let me ask you a question. If you're in Seattle, if you are in Tacoma, and you want to make the decision that you're going to boycott a, a, an establishment that sells Israeli products. It's, it's very likely that that's going to be an establishment owned by a Jewish person. If you're not gonna, if you're not gonna patronize the store, are you gonna socialize with the owner of the store? Are you gonna yeah. have coffee out on a sidewalk with that person? Are right. you gonna that's invite their point. kids over to have to your kid's birthday party? Yeah, and well, one thing that uh, we need to do right now, though, too, is uh, I want people to realize that the, the Lord is our God. Yes. And as long as he is our God, that's who we can trust in. Amen. So we're going to listen to Sarah Sanders sing a song that is called, Lord Our God. spoken 
true and given just to be for us only holy you are holy holy and king king over Okay, well, thank you, Sarah Sanders, and that was just wonderful. And of course, Sarah Sanders, who is our associate uh, worship director at El Shaddai, has just released a CD called You Will Not Fail, and that was one of the selections, and it's wonderful. Yes, it certainly it is. brings one into the presence of God. Randy, I want to uh, key off on the last point that you made about uh, boycotting Israel products. A lot of people don't realize it, but many of us have in our pockets cell phones. There's a lot of products that Israel has put out uh, that we don't realize technologically how they put them out before the U.S. ever had them or they were ever, for example, a cell phone. When we talk about boycotting products, I want you to bring that up about what you said about uh, storekeepers and so on. It, the last point that you'd made. About crystal knock when they about were all damaged? About crystal knock, yes. Yeah, well, uh, you know, to springboard back into that, you know, if, if the people that are claiming you know, that we need to boycott Israeli products. If they have even an inkling of integrity, if all, if all of their integrity could just fit into their little finger, then if they're gonna really be accountable to really boycott Israeli products, then they should get rid of their cell phone. That's right. They should get rid of their laptop. <laughs> they should get rid of, you know, non-radioactive medical scanners, uh, many vaccinations and medicines that come out of Israel. Uh, they should boycott all of the produce that's irrigated with drip cherry irrigation. Toma you know, cherry tomatoes. Yes, yeah, sure, yeah, you know, you, you see these uh, uh, strawberries that are the size of oranges, thanks to uh, drip irrigation out of Israel, and it goes on and on and on. When it comes to cutting edge technology, whether it be agriculture, medicine, communication, energy, right. environmental. You know, Genesis 12.3, we're, we're very familiar with the first two lines. I'll bless those that bless thee, and I'll curse thee that curse thee. But we need to really appreciate the last one, and in you all the families of the earth That's shall right. be blessed. Uh, that the incredible, includes us. Yeah. That includes us. You know, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's hard to, to fathom that a, a, a people group that makes up less than one quarter That's of right. the world's one population. One quarter of one percent. One. Let me correct that. Yeah. Less than one quarter of one percent. Point two two of the world population is responsible for twenty five to thirty five percent of the Nobel prizes. Exactly. More Nobel Peace Prizes That's than right. all the, their neighbors combined. Uh, and the reason that that is is because their conviction, their tikkun, their their absolute conviction to leave the world a better, better place, place than they found it. So that's, that's the people group that these people want to boycott. They, these are the products that these people are asking you to do. And I, want to, I just want to just ask people to take a reality check. Do you really think that boycotting is politically correct that has absolutely no negative ramifications other than just a political platform or political strategy? Uh, think again, because what's going to happen is if you're not going to shop at a person's store, you're not going to socialize with the person that owns that store. And pretty soon you're not going to want that store to even be in your town. And pretty soon the people group that that store is affiliated with, 
if, if, it's, if it's Israeli products, it's probably a Jewish-owned store. And, and pretty soon, this seemingly harmless movement has ostracized a people group, and that's the first step to delegitimizing that people that's group, right. and that's the first step to demonizing that people group. And so we need to be very careful that we don't uh, have deja vu all over again, because we are very similar to the days of 1938 right now. Well, what I can't believe is the hypocrisy where they won't boycott like Sudan or some of these other nations <laughs> that are just right. Syria. How come there's no, on these college campuses, you know, uh, these kids aren't being honest. I mean, if they're really honest in their convictions, they need to start boycotting a lot of the other countries that are much worse than Israel. You know, G G it's, on, on uh, Sunday mornings, many times pastors will teach on John chapter 10, verse 10, where Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Do they realize that some of that, <clears throat> that abundance and that prosperity comes through the Jewish people who have been a blessing, who have been Amen. a light to the nations? I yeah, mean, really, what, that's right. where that comes from. Well, well, tell me this, Randy. You're with Christians United for Israel. So tell me who Christian United for Israel is. Yeah. Evidently, there may be some people who aren't familiar. So why do they exist? Who and why? Okay, well, uh, before I do that, I want to just encourage the listening audience, or again, the viewing audience, I, I can right. think that we're on the radio, uh, <laughs> to uh, maybe get a pen and paper on hand because we'll give you some websites and some notes to take. Uh, one of the things I'd like folks to encourage, you, we, in this last segment, we covered a lot of things that were foreign to folks, and uh, for them to really get a better, under, a really crisp understanding, I would highly recommend uh, that they get David Brog's book, Standing with Israel. Uh, it, it really, this is an observant Jew that understands uh, cr the Christian gospel and, and the, the salvation message and dispensationalism, but more as importantly, the Christian history to the Jewish people and, uh, and, and those righteous Gentiles that rose up, people that we want to emulate uh, in the days that come. Uh, that's an important book, and he is our executive director. And, and when, you, when you take a look at Christian Giant for Israel, it, uh, it's, only, it's only just barely six years old but uh, it's, it was 30 years in the making. And it goes back to the days when Pastor John Hagee, who has a, a little chapel of about 20,000 members in San Antonio, uh, you know, he, uh, as he tells the story, he went to Israel as a, as a tourist and he came back as a Zionist. And he didn't know what to do. The Lord put it on his heart to do something for Israel. And he didn't know what that was until uh, Israel did the preemptive strike on the Iraqi nuclear reactor, I believe it was 1982. And he realized that Israel had just done the world an incredible favor by keeping nuclear weapons out of the hands That's right. of a maniacal dictator. Does that sound familiar? It does. <laughs> just a wee bit. And so, uh, but the international media was vitriolic. They were, they called it gunboat diplomacy. And uh, Pastor Hagee saw the merit of, of Israel's actions and said, you know what, we need to send a message to Israel and the Jewish community in, in America that uh, the Christians realized that Israel just did an incredible act to, to really save the, save the world. And so he decided to take it upon himself to have a night honor Israel at the convention center in San Antonio. It was, it was not the launching of an organization. It was not the unveiling even of an annual event. It was supposed to be uh, just a one-time event to respond to this international incident. And, uh, and so he, you know they have this event, it was just packed. Uh, when they announced that they're going to have the event, a uh, phone at the church rang. They picked it up. Voice on the other end said, Hagee will be dead by Friday. Wow. It's amazing. And uh, the windows in his car were shot out. And, and uh, his wife, Diana, said, you know, they didn't teach us stuff about this in seminary. <laughs> and uh, I didn't really sign up for this. And he said, don't worry. We're just going to do this one event. And we'll be done with it. And we're, and we'll close that chapter and we'll move on. And uh, they did the event, and as the event was coming to a close, the security captain gave them a note. And, and it said, there's a bomb threat on this, on this property. And he said to the fellow, how serious do you take it? And he said, I'm having my personnel evacuate the, the premises, meaning that the security people were leaving. When the security wow. people leave, that's a red flag yeah, for that me. Is that's a, not that's... a good sign when the security people leave. And so, uh, so that, uh, you don't have to know Pastor Hagee very long or very well to know that uh, he doesn't manipulate well when you push a button like that. And so he said, you know, if that's how these redneck anti-Semites feel about this, we'll do it every year until they get used to it. And uh, they have the video. They have the video. Okay. 
So, uh, you know, let's, um, let's, let's let him say it in his own words, and let's, go, let's hear what he has to say about why he founded Christians United for Israel. Oh, great, you got a video for us. Yes. As a minister, we were a very religious family. So, I think with that strong emphasis that uh, I went in the direction of the ministry, which has proven to be the right choice. I went to Israel in 1978. I went there as a tourist, and I came home a Zionist. And while I was praying at the Western Wall, I saw a Jewish man praying, rocking back and forth, kissing the Bible with a prayer shawl on. And it dawned on me that I had been raised in the church, and I didn't know one thing about that man. And so I went on a three-year study bench uh, so that I could uh, become equipped to reach out and to relate to the Jewish community in a meaningful way. I really didn't know how to go about that until the bombing of the nuclear reactor in 1981. When Israel attacked Iraq in 1981, the media in San Antonio was very critical of Israel. Good evening. The aftershock is beginning to mount in the wake of Israel bombing a nuclear plant in Iraq. Using American made And I felt Israel had done the world a favor. And I said to my wife while I'm watching the 10 o'clock news, I want to have a night to honor Israel. I want to invite every pastor in San Antonio to go to the municipal auditorium. And I want to tell the Jewish community and the national television audience how much we should appreciate Israel for what they've done. Our first night to honor Israel was 25 years ago. We had 3,000 people there. This year, a night to honor Israel is being conducted in 40 major American cities. We needed, as a Christian community, to have an organization where every Christian church, every Christian believer who was pro-Israel could have the opportunity to stand up and speak up for Israel. Now, millions of Christians from Maine to California are involved in defending Israel and advocacy for Israel in these ways. One, we're going to Washington, we're speaking to senators and congressmen, which is something Christians have never done. We will send emails, faxes, phone calls to senators and congressmen from every state in the union so that when the senators and congressmen ask their staff, what's the mail today? It runs off the charts in support of Israel and it's Christians who are supporting Israel. There is a new breed of Christian on the street. They are Christians who are pro-Israel. We both want good things to happen to Israel. Israel is an American asset because it's a democracy, because it is a friend that stabilizes the Middle East, because they are a loyal partner. Let's unite our strengths, our energies, and our people, and win this battle. Well, thank you. That, that was uh, just a wonderful, wonderful video. And I'm just so excited that we're going to have Pastor John Hagee right yes. here in Tacoma, oh, Washington at LCDI Ministry. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just amazing to me, you know, uh, that video. I mean, uh, people need to hear that. So many people think they shouldn't be politically involved. I mean, some people think, well, it's okay to love and support Israel, but we don't want to get involved with politics or things like that. What do you have to say about to those people? You know, a, a couple of things. Uh, you know, and first, before we before I address it, I just want to tell people that uh, you know, pa most people know Pastor Hagee from his television program. Uh, I, I want to just say, uh, for the record, that when there's no microphone around, when there's no audience around, when there's no camera around. He is the salt of the earth. He is the real deal. He is the amazing blend of humility and authority. And he is the real deal. And the Lord has made him the carrier of this vision and has given him a mantle of authority. And, uh, and he has carried out, and it's an honor and privilege to, to be with him. And anybody that uh, is within uh, sight of this uh, broadcast, please join us on August 27th. You won't 
regret it, I promise you. Very good. <laughs> now, so. I'm not going to steal your thunder on this, <laughs> but I, uh, as I mentioned to you, it was over six years ago that my wife and I were invited to a meeting uh, here in Seattle. Yes. And uh, it was about an organization that Pastor Hagee was going to start called, which was already somewhat in effect, which was Christians United for Israel. Mm -hmm. And we went to this meeting, and there was probably about seven or eight people that were there. And, uh, but the things that were said at that meeting were very, very exciting. We, in fact, we had just returned from Israel, so we were, we were really uh, churned up about Israel and what we could do. We immediately went to see Pastor Mark to tell him about it, and we had to, so we attended the very, very first one. But what I would like you to talk about is just from that one meeting, we knew we had about right. seven people. Talk to us about where Christians United Israel is today. Yes. Well, it really, uh, I believe it really underscores the fact that uh, this is a move of God. This, isn't the, this is not uh, the plans right. of a man. This is not right. a, gr a group of you know, executives that came up with a keen idea and cracked the code <laughs> on how to market something. Uh, we, are tr we are trying to stay out of his way and keep up with what right. he is doing. When you went to that lunch meeting, at that point we probably had a few hundred members. Uh, five months after we were founded, we convened in Washington, D.C. You know, leaders had hoped and prayed that maybe two or four hundred people would join us in Washington, D.C. in July 2006. Thirty-six hundred showed up in Washington, right. D.C. just five months after the founding. And, and, and while we were on Capitol Hill, that, 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 first, uh, that first D.C. summit, and we invite our viewing audience to join us in D.C. this July. Go to CUFI.org to look about, uh, learn about how you can be part of of uh, joining probably 6,000 other crazy Zionists on Capitol Hill, sending a message to our elected officials that it's not just their Jewish constituents that care about U.S. Israel right. relations. The Christians vote people into office, and we vote people out of office. But when we met that first time, we had barely 8,500 members. As we're meeting here today, uh, we are on the th cusp of breaking a million members nationwide. It's amazing. <laughs> I mean, just amazing. <laughs> Talk about yeah. uh, a little bit how how that affects the nation when it comes to votes relative to Israel or supporting Israel, which affects America. And I think you want to probably talk about that as well. How does, how does yeah. uh, votes that turn against Israel in the U.S. affect us? It, it's extremely important. You know, Pastor Mark touched on the fact that, that Christians, they have a tough time reconciling to putting their hands to politics and, and figuring out where does that fit in right. a genuine right. life of faith. That's a good point. And, yeah. you know, uh, I, to that, I would suggest, you know, crack open the first few chapters in Nehemiah. Uh, you know, here you've got a guy who scholars say he, he'd never been in Jerusalem before. <laughs> right. And he had this incredible burden for the holy city. And one day his brother and some writers come into town and they say, you know, he says, how is Jerusalem? And they say, it's not good, man. Right. People have been scattered. The gates have been burned. The walls have been broken. And right. this man who had never been there falls to his knees and, and weeps and he mourns and he fasts. And, and, and if you want to hang on to your, you know, not get politically involved thing, then the way that those passages should read from that point on is that he stayed on his knees praying and another writer came into town and said, hey, I've got great news. Jerusalem's been restored. Somebody else has rebuilt the walls and somebody else has rebuilt the gates and somebody else has restored the people. But it doesn't say that. It says that he prayed like none of us ever have or ever will. And then he got up from his knees, he appealed to the king, he got permission to cross foreign land and to harvest the cedars and act as an interim governor. And with a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other right. hand, he tangibly acted and Jerusalem was restored. And that's what we're asking people to do. Yes. We're, asking people to, we're asking people to pray. Like if, they, if you're not praying for the peace of Jerusalem, start. Right. That's right. And if you already are, then do it more. But well, that's what Jesus, a, didn't Jesus say, pray amen. for the peace of Jerusalem. Let's then, get up yeah. from our knees and, let, you know, let's pray. Let's get up from our knees and then lock our arms and join our voices together. And by, by joining the nearly million members uh, with your voices, uh, here's, you know, a lot of people don't take emails very seriously. They don't take faxes very seriously. They don't, they don't take uh, phone calls very seriously. But you know who takes those things very seriously? Politicians? Our elected <laughs> officials. Because the formula goes like this, ladies and gentlemen. It's, you may not realize this. If you take two or three minutes to send in an email, gosh, I really hope that, uh, you know, dear Congressman, I really hope that you are going to vote for tougher sanctions on Iran, and you send that email in, the receptionist at the office looks at that, 
And the way they figured into their formula is that that email represents about 999 other people right. that feel the same way that you do, but didn't bother to take the two minutes to send in the email. If you take the time to write a postcard in your own writing, and then you take the time to look up the mailing address in the phone book, and you rifle through your wife's purse for a stamp, and then you walk to the mailbox, and you put it in there, and it goes through the anthrax screening in six weeks, and it finally makes it onto their desk in DC. They open it up. They think that that represents 9,999 other people that feel the same way you do. So when, when we send out an action alert, go to cufi.org to join our rapid response action alert. When there's a critical piece of legislation pending, we'll send out an action alert. You simply do one click and, and authorize that you're going to send a letter into your elected official. It's going to join tens of thousands, and it's going to inundate, nearly shut down the servers in DC. That's right. Yeah. And, That's right. and let people know, and they pay attention. We've, we, have seen, we, we, we have seen like that video. We have seen positions. We've seen individuals. And, uh, and even organizations do that 180, uh, heading off to try to make this position, realizing that elected officials, or, or constituents, I should say, don't want their elected right. officials to take that route. And when they, they listen and they, you know, they, do, they, they change their Isn't facts. that what happened with the Seattle bus In ads? Seattle, Tell that's us right. about the Seattle bus yeah. ads. Yes, well, I can't, we cannot take full credit for what happened with the Seattle bus ads. I have to give credit to other organizations that, that really broke the ground and brought it to our attention. But the reality is, is that the sheer uh, numbers of CUFI uh, is a classic illustration of the example that I'm trying to cite. Here, uh, with the, the Seattle bus ads that you're citing, it's essentially the same organization and essentially the same message. Jennifer, if you want to put up that bus ad graphic uh, so that the folks can, can realize what we're talking. This ad was uh, slated to go on the sides of the Seattle metro system. And uh, a number of organizations, we've got to bear in mind that this is, this is the city in which just a few years ago, somebody busted that's into right. the Jewish Federation, shouted a, an expression that's very common in the Middle East mm -hmm. before slaying three people, three Jews in Seattle. Uh, it'd be, you'd think that this city would be kind of sensitive to not uh, you know, allowing messages that are inciting, or that are hateful. That's right. But this is a message that is seeking once again to delegitimize and to demonize the Jewish state. And it was slated to run. It was good to go. The, the contracts were signed. A number of Jewish organizations voiced their concerns. Over the, week, over the course of a week's time, the Metro system had received about 1,800 emails. Uh, they thought they were still going to let it run. They had enough uh, complaints where they decided to have a kind of a community meeting. And different organizations and representatives of synagogues had their time at the microphone to state their case. Mm -hmm. And after all the arguments had been heard, uh, the metro system said, you know what, thanks for coming, we're going to let the ads run. Right. That's when Christians United for Israel pulled the trigger on their the rapid emails. response action right. alert. Within just a few hours, the metro system had 6,000 new messages in their inbox. They did a new press conference that said, you know what, we've changed your mind. We're not going to yeah. let our bus ads. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's a perfect example of, the, uh, of the, the populace. Uh, not being aware of where Israel really has their stand and then come out with ads on the side of a bus, the general populace wouldn't really know because they were uneducated. That's yeah. right. So that's why it was a great thing for, for that to be able to be turned over. So. Yes. And I'm really glad for that. What we're going to do right now, we're going to go to a song by Sarah Sanders called You Will Be Found. That's a good one.
strength to sustain me. What's amazing is that uh, a little over 2,000 years ago, uh, here it was a carpenter from uh, Nazareth or Nazareth that uh, was in the Galilee and met a few fishermen. And because of uh, the word that was spoken, there are millions of people that now follow Jesus. And I think what people are beginning to find is that, you know, we all live in local communities. And it's amazing how you find out that if you attended uh, a city council meeting, uh, how much you can really change in your community because most people don't show up because they don't think they can really change anything. And we know from Jesus that he changed the whole world. In fact, the Pharisees said the whole world has gone after him. Well, on a community scale, we can do that. But many people realize or they think that the, our government is unreachable as well, particularly when it comes to certain elements that we're talking about. You want to talk about that a little bit, about our involvement and what we can do to reach a whole nation with this message as well? Well, folks watching this program, if you get nothing out of this whole 90 minutes other than what Art just touched on, then get that. Uh, probably one of the greatest resources, one of the greatest weapons that the enemies of Israel have sit in the pews of our churches every Sunday morning. Yes. And it is, uh, I mean that with, with love and respect in the, in the context that they, those individuals, the people that sit next to you, behind you, in front of you, grossly underestimate the importance and the impact of their single vote, of their single voice. They don't realize how important it is. They don't realize uh, that, that their elected officials want to hear what they have to say. That, you know, don't wait until they've done something that angers you before you pick up the phone. Uh, you'd, be, you'd be really surprised. You'd be inspired and even encouraged uh, to, to learn that they, they want to hear y your opinion. Uh, so, and that's one of the things that, that really confounds us when we embarked on this. Uh, you know, the people would gravitate towards our Standing with Israel meetings or our pastor's lunches or our nighttime Israels or even going, not quite going to D.C., but just those, the, the folks that come to an audience like this, it's about Israel, I'm going to go. And, and my church has an Israeli flag and my church sends money to a food closet in Tel Aviv. And, you know, my church prays, you know, ceaselessly for the peace of Jerusalem. But, but you mentioned getting involved in politics. And they're almost repulsed yes, by that idea. That's right. And so, uh, you know, just want them to revisit what we just talked about with Nehemiah, because you can make an incredible, an, an, an incredible difference. And, and one of the, one of the ways that we invite you to do that is through our action uh, response team. And another is if your if your vacation days and dollars allow it, if you can make it, then join us in Washington D.C. Uh, July 16th through the through the 18th. Uh, you will be inspired to see our elected officials. Uh, actually looking forward to meeting with us. The first year, you know, this is going to be our seventh time, the seventh year in D.C. The first year we had 3,600. We we're expecting between five and 6,000 this time. The first year they didn't know that we were coming. <laughs> the second year they didn't think that we would come uh, back. And we had 4,000 the second yeah. year. The third year they were kind of hoping that we wouldn't come back. <laughs> exactly. And we had 4,500 that That's year. Right. Uh, you know, gas is almost yeah. $5 a gallon. The economy is on the ropes. That's we right. thought that no one would come. Our numbers continue to That's grow. Right. Wow. But we raised up our, 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 <clears throat> our really pilot initiative, Christian Giant for Israel on campus, where we are really trying to counter that anti-Semitism that you had raised earlier. Uh, that's where it's manifesting yes. itself. That's where the delegitimizing and demonizing of Israel is taking place. That's where it is not just you know, tolerable to be anti-Semitic. It's downright fashionable right. to be anti-Semitic on our campuses, as long as you veil it as anti-Zionism, as anti-Israel. And that's where we're, we're, we're bringing our, our, elect, our, our elected officials a glimpse that we've got these college students, hundreds of them, that's right. that are going to be facilitating our groups. And if the listening, if the viewing audience, if the people with us today 
uh, can join us, and we would be delighted to have them join us. Let today. me ask you yeah. this: Are there are you open to going to see other pastors in the area? We would love to meet with pastors. We would love, you know, the, this event that we have coming up on March 26. Uh, that event, I don't care if you're in Idaho, I don't care if you're in Alaska, if you're watching this online, uh, wherever you are, if you're in part of the United States, we can make arrangements to do a Standing with Israel meeting where we will equip your congregation and community to understand how and why Christians should stand with Israel. From 90, in 90 minutes, we'll bring them from why should I care about Israel to what can I do to stand right. with Israel. And it's not gonna cost you a dime. You don't have to make a financial commitment. You don't have to cover our airfare. You don't have to cover our hotel. Uh, just allow us the facility, arrange for somebody to unlock the door and turn on the lights logistically. They're extremely easy to facilitate. And you will have a life-changing, history-shaping uh, event in your community. So just go to cufi.org and look at how to do a Standing with Israel event and submit the speaker request and we'll get it on calendar. And the pastors in this area, they can actually come. It's this coming Monday night, March 26th. Any of the pastors in the area can come to this event. In Tacoma, uh, In Tacoma at El Shaddai. So they can get an idea and a feel of what your Standing with Israel events are all about and then they can decide at that time if they want to have one at their local congregation. Yes, and I encourage them to uh, encourage their college age students to attend the event as well. We have scholarships to bring them to D.C. in July. Uh, very little money out of their pocket to go where they will really uh, be equipped to come back. That's right. And uh, we're, when we start a chapter on a campus, we're not trying to mute the anti-Israel camp. We're not trying to dismantle them. We're simply gonna make sure that the, that the playing field is leveled sure. and that, the, the, right. uh, that Israel is fairly and accurately portrayed. Speaking from experience, of course, we've been to the nation's capital a number of times now uh, and have gone through the Senate rooms and so on and, and the, uh, the House. And what's really interesting is how accessible they really are. And you had mentioned uh, them being open to us coming into their offices. And when they see 30 people from Kufi coming down the hallway to come into their office, they get humble very quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the greatest testimonies to this is that, uh, and I had mentioned this to you afterwards, after we had visited one of our representatives here in the state of Washington, that uh, Israel was very connected with uh, a certain defense issue that we brought up in part of our talk track when we were in one of their offices. And uh, later, uh, and it came to our attention that one of these representatives had not even voted on this issue. And so after we were in there and we brought it to their attention, I got an email a week later that he changed his vote in All favor right. of Israel. So, uh, you know, who are we but just some, some citizens? We're not politicians, but we can come into the nation's capital uh, and be excited about and have passion about what we're talking about. See, that's the thing is that when we talk about the biblical Israel, everyone in this, uh, this viewing audience, they know about Israel, they know about the land of Israel, but they're thinking about biblical Israel. Folks, we are in biblical Israel today. Current day Israel, what we're going through right now is the Israel of the Bible that we're talking about. So anything that we can do to affect that, Israel affects the destiny of the world. Yeah. Isn't that right? It really does. It does. And so when we go to our nation's capital, which is what Kufi does, it has an impact on the politicians that lead this nation. So. Well, when you said an email represents a thousand and yeah, an actual amazing. letter represents yeah. 10,000, how many do they think an actual body spending money flying all the way that's to there right. represents? That's right. You know, I'm, I'm so glad, Pastor Mark, that you brought that up because that is that is exactly the, the, the bullseye of the point that I'm trying to make. You know, an email or a phone call represents a thousand, postcard 10,000. When you are there, uh, it's it's off the radar. It's off the Richter scale. You know, the first few times, I'll warn you folks. I'll give you a heads up and, and just be braced that when you're in that office, it may seem that that elected official's not paying attention. Oh, he is. It, it may seem that he's thinking about something else. He is thinking about something else. You know what he's or he or she's thinking about? He realizes how that you just spent your vacation dollars to come. That's you're right. not a paid lobbyist. You're not wearing five thousand dollar alligator shoes. Right. You know, you are a living, breathing constituent. And he's thinking how many dollars you spent to get there, how many dollars you're spending to stay there, and he's realizing this is important, and if it's that important to you, it must be very, very important to many, right. many more <laughs> like you. And this is an election year. Folks, right. you know, uh, Pastor Art just touched on the importance of the hour that we're in as far as Israel goes. Uh, one of, the, one of uh, a precious friend of mine and one of the greatest supporters of, of Christian United for Israel and one of the greatest champions of Israel that I've ever met uh, just recently passed away. His name was Pastor Glenn Cole in Sacramento, California. 
an incredible man, an incredible man of God. And, and before he passed away, he gave a, a message. And it kind of it didn't quite contradict or rival uh, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul tells <laughs> us that, 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 our, that our life is a race. Right. But Pastor right. Cole made a point that it's, that it's really just a, one dash. You know, when, when we pass away, the folks at our memorial is going to get a piece of paper. And the front page is going to have a date that we were born. It's going to have a date that we died. And between those two dates is just this little dash that, that really encompasses the entirety of our life. And what type of impact does that dash represent? And there are people that are watching this right now that really want to know that their life made yes. an impact, that it counted. Right. And with all due respect to all the other noble causes and the people that really need to hear the gospel in your family and circle of acquaintances, I would suggest to you that there are few things, if there is anything, that's as relevant that you can put your hand and heart to as coming alongside the nation of Israel right now. This, the United States. <laughs> The language that we've heard in the past, the posturing that we've seen coming out of D.C., it, it is frighteningly uh, apparent that this nation is dangerously close to throwing Israel under the bus. Yes. And, yes. And, and I firmly believe, as millions of others do, that the day that that happens is the beginning of the end right. of life as this nation knows it. Is the, right. you know, the quality of life, the, the position and station that America has enjoyed as a world leader we believe is directly connected to the fact that we were the first nation to recognize That's the reestablishment right. of the Jewish state. That's right. And the day that we sever that, the day that we right. turn our back on that, is the day that we're going to see some storms cloud, storm clouds gathering that, uh, that we would not wish on anybody. Yeah, I, I really believe that we live in prophetic times of destiny. Yes, we do. Yes, and we, do. Uh, we were created for such a time as this. And for us to live at this time, we could have been born in any time in That's history, right. but God wanted us right here, right now at this time to make a difference in people's lives, to have an impact in our life. And, and I really believe also that people need to understand that if we side with the nation of Israel, uh, uh, realize we, we shouldn't be dividing their land. We support Israel and the Jewish people. And like you said, not throw the whole nation of Israel under the bus. You're going to have an impact that will be That's eternal. Right. Mm. You know, Another, all, uh, <laughs> it's all believers, all believers that who believe in Jesus Christ and pastors should never feel shy, but they should be more curious as to why we are making such a fuss about Israel. Yes. Uh, they should never feel that it's something that's in the past, that Israel had its day, and we're moving on with the church, because that's really the, the whole demise and the, the root of replacement theology. All pastors, if pastors can really put more of an interest in Israel and understanding who the Jewish people are, it would change everything. It would change the world. Yes. Yeah, you know, uh, it happens at your events. It's going to happen at the event that we're going to have on the 26th. It's going to happen at the event that we have on, on August 27th. And that is at the end of the event, there will be people that, and they may even line up to say it. Uh, there will be people that are going to come up. There are probably people in this audience that experienced this one time where the Lord has put this incredible burden and affinity for Israel on their heart to the degree that they come up and they say, I, I think I should have a DNA test because I think I might be part <laughs> Jewish. I don't know why I love Israel so much. Yeah. It really and, is amazing. And, and they, they, they have this love that's about to burst and they don't know what to do with it. And, and Christian Giant for Israel provides a vehicle provides them a resource. We're not trying to expand an, an organization. We're trying to provide them a means where they can tangibly make a difference. If you send in an email by yourself because you read a column in the paper, it's one email haphazardly. If you write a postcard because you heard something on the news, it's one postcard that gets lost in a blur. But when you join your voice, right. and when you lock your arms with hundreds of thousands of others, and your message you know, hits those servers with tens of thousands at a time, you are making an impact and you're making a difference. And so I really, really would encourage pastors to uh, just to take a look at it. You know, if we take a look at the, uh, Isaiah 62, uh, you know, you read, you read through all, all of Isaiah 62, and it, and it, it, kinds of, it, it is very convicting. It sheds a big light on something that I want to challenge that I see in churches today. It's really common. Uh, when we look for areas of service and ministry to serve in churches, we gravitate towards those things that interest us. 
You know, we grew up in motorcycle mystery, bikers for right, Christ. Right. You know, we want to we want to serve in an area that's lined up with what we love and what we're passionate about. You know, I want to be I want to do the fly fishing ministry. That's what I want to do. The fly fishing. You know, <laughs> you know and so uh, you know, I, but there's not one in the church. You know, so but but and so a lot of times we categorize and pigeonhole areas of service. And in every church, not in yours, I know, but in most churches. There's a group of people that love Israel, and they think that, that the love and, and you know, ministry of Israel is for that little group to do. You know, that, that everybody else doesn't need to do it because that little group of folks is doing it. Right. But if you, take a, you read all the way through Isaiah 62, Isaiah 62 talks about a category of folks that the Lord commands to give himself and themselves no rest right. until he makes Jerusalem That's a right. praise of That's all the exactly right. And that, and who, what, Thank you, Lord. That's right. And, yes. And what is that category of folks? Anybody that calls upon his name. That's, That's right. what it says. So uh, right. if you call upon his name, you're in that category. We identify with Israel through Jesus Christ. Amen. Tell us without going through, in the few minutes that we have left, without going through your testimony. Of course, you have been a, a believer, a Christian, a believer in Jesus Christ for a while. When you really recognized how big a part Israel was in the world today, how that changed your whole faith. I'm, I'm glad you bring that up, Art. You know, first, let me, uh, you know, I was, before I even became a Christian, hand me that box of tissues. Have, that <laughs> have the tissues that ready. Uh, before I came, became uh, a Christian, I was in a Bible study for months. I was determined to not surrender. I just wanted to become a better dad and a better right. father. And uh, I was in this, and I and asked the question to the fellows that were facilitating this Bible study. I said, uh, this Israel, and you touched on this earlier, is this like Israel in, in the news? And they laughed out loud. And they, they, no, 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 just pretend that it says the church there. And, uh, and I've learned, you know, uh, there's folks in the audience, there's folks watching the show. You open up their Bible and page after page, there's, right. there are pencils or pen that are underlining passages right. that spoke to them. Yes. There are people that don't think twice about taking a highlighter to their Bible on passages that were written just for the okay. season that they're in. I don't think there's anybody watching the show that's ever taken a bottle of white out to their Bible. Uh, right. and, and when we see the word Israel, you know, we see a uh, reference to not just a piece of geography, but also to the biological descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I want to, uh, I want also want to just touch on your, what you said about our faith in Jesus Christ. Some folks take issue to the fact that a Christian Giant for Israel events don't have an altar call at the end. They're not church services. Right. They are, right. they're either educational events or they're solidarity events in, 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 in partnership with the local Jewish communities. And, and, and I want to just set the record straight and give a really important disclaimer. One of the first things I do when I meet with any Jewish audience, Jewish leadership, or do a presentation mm -hmm. of any kind, that invariably has Jewish members in the audience, I tell them, you know, I, I'm a Christian. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out what I believe if I'm right, a Christian. Sure. I believe Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Right. I don't make a secret about that. Right. I don't make an apology about that. And I hope that people see him reflected in me when I don't know that they're watching me. Mm -hmm. right. The caveat that's kind of a new paradigm on the horizon through Christian Giant for Israel is I don't demand, we don't demand that the Jewish people agree with us theologically before we're going to stand yeah. with them unwaveringly. Well, thank you uh, so much for being with us, Randy. We're just so glad you're here, and yes. I'm just so glad that we're going to have uh, a big crowd on yes, Monday night, March 26th, to come and listen to this Stand for Israel event. And our viewer audience yes. should join us with that, too. Exactly. Well, we're going to close now with this song by Sarah Sanders called All Glory.
changed in the wake of when you've died. All glory is yours alone. You've placed me here at the foot of your throne, and I will worship you and you alone. For all of the glory is yours. All of the glory is yours. All of the glory is yours. Sarah Sanders. And that is true with all that we're talking about here, uh, Randy. Of course, we, we mentioned politics a little bit as far as Christians United for Israel, but all the glory goes to God. When we talk about Israel and what the Jewish people have done and, and us joining hands with them, it's to God's glory. Isn't that right? Amen. Amen. So if we have just a few minutes left, what would be your closing thoughts on uh, individuals and in their understanding of exactly uh, what you're doing and what we should be doing now? Uh, one thing I would, you know, okay. I'll, I'll start with a, with a couple shameless plugs. Okay. A couple books that will really kind of really help crystallize. One is called In Defense of Israel by Pastor Hagee. Another is called In Defense of Faith by David Brog. Those two books coupled together will really just unpack everything that we tried to touch on. But what, what, we, what I tried to convey today uh, really is distilled down to something that happened in 2007 at our second uh, CUFI DC summit. The first year, we learned naively that the media was not out to cast Christians in a very good light. Uh, really? they, they would tend to want to make a caricature out of us. And so we made some guidelines and rules and had designated areas for them our next summit. And, and we were all queued up to make sure they were abiding by those rules. And uh, as I was going through the convention center, I noticed that uh, there was a mic boom and a big shoulder camera where it was not supposed to be. And so I went over to uh, kind of see if I needed to intervene. And there's a fellow that was interviewing a white-haired lady uh, with a tattoo on her left forearm. And with a near sarcastic, condescending tone of voice and attitude, he says, uh, how does it make you feel to know that after all that you survived and all that you endured, that with the president of, of Iran on the rise and seeking nuclear weapons, that your, your children and grandchildren are probably going to face the same thing. And without missing a beat, she said, it's not the same thing. She said, we were alone that time. We're not alone this time. That's, That's right. what this all boils down to. So I, I, I make no apology for for trying to I won't manipulate anyone and I don't want to try to pressure anybody but if if this resonates with what the Lord has put on your heart to do with Israel and the Jewish people if you have the means and the resources to join us in Washington DC yes there are few things in your life that you can do that will have such an important impact on on, on the direction of uh, the relationship with the US and Israel and and the uh, the the America that we're going to hand over to our children and grandchildren. That's right. That's right. And uh, we want to thank you again for being here, Randy. And we're looking forward thank to you. having you on March 26th. And, you know, for our viewing audience, those of you that do need help, and of course, we always want to praise the Lord. We always want to praise Him, of course, in good times, but sometimes even in difficult times, we have to praise Him because we know that He'll come through for us. We know that when we pray, He hears us. And so I'd like to close this session. Thanks again for Pastor Mark and uh, Randy Neal, and I'll close with a word of prayer. Gracious God and King, our Heavenly Father, you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're the Father of our Lord yes. Jesus Christ. Father, there is nothing that is impossible for you. Yes, Father, Lord. in this day and time, you know the times and seasons. Our times are in your hands. And so, Father, whatever that's yes, come Lord. across us today, whatever is before us, behind us, we know that, Lord, that you will guide us in everything that we do. So bless this people. Yes, Father. And thank you, Lord, for meeting every need that they may have, whether it be physical or spiritual, because you are a God that hears and answers prayer. We love you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen and amen. Amen. Praise amen. the Lord. Amen. Yes, thank All you. Right.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you, Dave. You, Randy, it's, it's just, it's so great to, to have you here with us. I'm so looking forward to uh, Monday night, March 26th. Yes. And it's and just going to be fantastic. Well. I'm looking Thank forward you. to it. Thank you. Thank you. Now until next time, remember to praise the Lord.